And I just want to introduce myself. I'm Mary Conley Eggert, uh, founder of Global Waterworks and an innovation officer with a team of wonderful marketers. We're trying to showcase the fact that water can work today. And uh, Seth, it was your book that helped make us aware that there are real world solutions making a difference. So tell us about uh, your journey, Seth, with the book. Well, thank you very much. Um, about five years ago, I learned about the coming global water crisis, and I started looking for some solutions to it. And what I discovered was, to my amazement, was that Israel actually might be the model to save the world from its crisis. And the reason I was amazed by it is because I had been to Israel, and I knew it as a dry place. Um, it's 60% desert. The rest of the country is semi-arid. And um, the rapidly growing population, fast growing economy, and it was the last place in the world I would imagine that didn't have ma massive water problems. But they have the opposite. Not only did they not have a shortage of water, but they had an abundance of water. And I thought this might be a model for the world. So I went to Israel repeatedly. I interviewed oh, about 220 people, and um, some of them multiple times, and came up with how Israel did it. And I was happy to share that with the world. And I wrote the book, and and as you point out, it's become a bestseller. There are 12 foreign language editions in the works now, and um, it's a pretty exciting story. Yeah, is there a movie also coming out? Did I hear that? Well, it's not coming out, but um, I've been approached by quite a number of Hollywood producers to uh, to uh, uh, sell them the uh, the uh, documentary film rights, and I'm definitely going to make a deal with one of them. I just haven't decided yet which one. Yes, I want to see who plays Oda Distel. Well, I, I'm thinking Brad Pitt for sure. <laughs> I think that would be a good, a good role for him. He'd have to grow his hair a little bit longer, though. And uh, yeah. I'm. Uh, thrilled to say we had Oded on the call last week describing uh, all the aspects of Israel's uh, holistic and fully integrated water management and conservation to monetary policy. And uh, what I think would be useful, Seth, is because not everyone had the chance to do two years of research or unfortunately even read your full book, if you could share with us some of the high-level findings from the book. Yes, with pleasure. The story of how Israel did it is a series of interconnected realities. First, is Israel has a water-revering culture. They educate their students about why water has to be treated specially and why uh, it's essential for everybody to be a partner in conservation. Um, after that, Israel has a very smart form of governance. They have a technocratic, apolitical style of governance in their water. And they, um, in addition, they have uh, smart market forces at work. They use price as a vehicle for helping to reduce consumption. And most significantly of all, Israel is a technology-revering society. They, it's a society that, that understands the value of science and focuses very much on what science can do to help them. And so starting from even before there was a state, Israel was thinking about how it could have a revolution in agriculture, to use less water, how they could fix their municipal water and the leaks there, how they could reuse sewage, how they could use desalination, and all this together brings Israel to the highest utility uh, per acre of produce grown in the world in its agriculture, in part thanks to the Israeli invention of drip irrigation. It's the largest by far, by far, by far society in the world reusing sewage, and it leads the world in energy efficient desalination. Right, a wonderful holistic mix of uh, solutions, you know, not just one, but uh, multiple sources as well as uh, every part of society involved in water management. And you bring up an important point, I think, the technicization, like democratization of water. Can you explain that just a little bit and the value that's been? Well, the democratization of water is that everybody has a stake in the outcome. It's not, a, it's not in the hands of elites. The reason why Israel succeeds is because it's part of everyone in society has a role. And that means also that when you're an entrepreneur, you're also understanding that there might be business opportunities in water. When you're an engineer or an inventor, you're thinking about what you can invent that will make things better in water. And that's all part of the, of the, of, of the formula. And I re report all that in my book, is that how that culture comes together, how they did it. 
Right, and and I think what's interesting is it's been a 50-year, almost 60-year type of partnership with California, where California, actually with Sidney Loeb, invented desalination and tested it there and transferred it over to Israel, and now it's uh, just established with Carlsbad. You just reported on that and the, the plant being named uh, you know, a real leader in, in America here. Uh, but if you could uh, tell us about your hope for uh, next week. We have uh, the largest gathering of Israel water engineers coming to Israel. They've been partnering for two years on uh, the memorandum of understanding between uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and Governor Brown. And uh, what would you encourage people uh, to anticipate and to get out of that conference? I'd love to do that. If I may just make one small historical correction, um, and that is that Sidney Loeb, who spent the rest of his life in Israel after working on uh, desalination, Sidney Loeb um, was not the inventor of desalination, he was the propagator of reverse osmosis. And, um, and in Israel itself, several different techniques like thermal distillation and so forth were either invented or perfected. And so that was how um, Israel played a part in desalination really back to the 1950s, as I tell the really remarkable story of some zany individuals who were involved. To go on to your question, specifically, it's not that Israel has any secret formula here. What, everything Israel does is available to the world. And the point of me writing the book was to make sure that everybody could see it. And the, the extent that the world becomes ever more aware of what Israel has done in its water will assure us all of a better water future and a safer world. And that's the value of these conferences where people get to talk about water but also talk about water solutions that they can use on a cost-efficient and energy-efficient way. Right, and I think that... Uh being elbow to elbow on these complex issues so that they can be resolved is important. But I, I know you've been having a lot of conversations with Felicia Marcus, who heads up the water board there, um, knowing you know the passion and interest in California. What do you anticipate could be the outcome? Could they take advantage of all the technology available today? Well, but speaking of Felicia Marcus, I have a podcast on my website, LetThereBeWater.com. And um, Felicia Marcus, well, Felicia Marcus is um, is one of the people I interview on one of my podcasts. So thank you for mentioning her. Also, uh, in a week or so, we'll be posting an interview I do with Karen Ross, who's the California State Agriculture Commissioner. But you know, California is smart. There's a lot of smart people there. They're great educational institutions. There's no reason why California can't be doing everything that Israel is doing, and that California's academic institutions and inventors can't be coming up with great solutions to Israel does not have a monopoly on, on brains or vision or guts. It just happens to be that in this realm of water, Israel started thinking about this in the 1930s, and as a result of it, they have a head start on the rest of the world that the world should piggyback on. Yeah, and it's wonderful. They've been extending their engineers to China, to Africa, to every corner of the globe, you know, and I just happened to be at the American Water Works Association meeting yesterday where a number of uh, folks in the technology area were talking about how do we get this technology uh, accelerated and into the marketplace, and the panel said, go to Israel. You need to be there. You need to sit with their water engineers. They are the leader in the world, and, uh, and they have... Uh, expertise across, as you say, not just desalination, but the wastewater treatment and the opportunity to recover. I think it's 90 percent, 85 to 90 percent, that they are now recovering and reusing. And um, uh, so when um, think about Seth's experience here, I know there's some people on the call who may have some questions. Uh, do you have a few minutes for questions, Seth? Sure, give it a shot. Great. I will start out as we wait for other questions, but just you let the water be water movement. What can people do personally? I know you have your website. Um, explain what you think would be valuable. Well, I'm going to be launching it in the fall, so um, I'm, I really don't have all the tools yet at hand. But what I'm asking people to do is to get involved in lobbying their public officials with specific asks, such as transforming agriculture, such as making better use of of uh, sewage, such as being smart about desalination and introducing technology into our daily lives in a way that it hasn't been before. So that will that will be what we will be asking people to do. But 
but if you are interested, please go to liftedbewater.com. Add your name to our mailing list, and we'll be in touch with you right after the summer. But there's a we have a very ambitious agenda coming. Yes, uh, wonderful. It was very exciting to hear about, and I think. <laughs> You've also seen a different thing happening with water, with the distributed systems of water, um, and the opportunity to, to manage a facility or an individual site through uh, solutions like MFCs, uh, on-site recycling. Um, do you envision a different type of water management in the future based on what you're seeing? Oh, oh positively. This is a rapidly evolving category, and I think that that's the best answer of all, which is it's not whatever great innovations Israel has found and developed is wonderful, but whether it's from Israel or Holland or elsewhere or California, the world will keep hopscotching to be ever more efficient and ever smarter. And we're, we're seeing that already. I think uh, the pilots and uh, the experiences that have been shared in preparation for this conference have uh, uh, been really impactful as people uh, from very large facilities are seeking out a way to ensure their uh, their participants in their property don't get faced with scarcity or shut down because they have no water to, to furnish their crops or their people. So um, we have a question. The most, the most important part of the lesson in this realm is not just what they did, but to understand that by prioritizing water and developing a societal reverence for it, by putting assets against it, both human and financial, you're going to get a great outcome, and that's what Israel did. Yeah, and I think outside of California um, and Israel, are you finding that other states in the U.S. or specific countries have a sense of a need to take action or who, who have been really exemplary? in the way they've implemented strategies from Israel? Well, I, thank you for that question. I tweet about water throughout the day at Seth M. Siegel, and uh, S-I-E-G-E-L, that's the, my last name. And um, what I can tell you is that the big tweet I made last night was that uh, as I was going to bed, I read a piece in the Hindustan Times of India where the water minister of India announced that their water problems are almost insurmountable, and they're now reaching out to Israel to have Israel help India fix their water future. Now, do you know how amazing that is? 25 years ago, India and Israel didn't even have diplomatic relations. It's amazing, so, right? So, so now Israel and India are joined at the hip in solving what is now identified as the largest problem facing India. And this is going on, if not everywhere in the world, then in many places in the world. It's very exciting, and uh, you've also made the comment about the alignment with water and peace. You know, where, where there is no water, there is war, and the migration of people to those water places. Any, uh, if you could just comment on on what that looks like. Well, Israel has shown that water doesn't have to be a source of conflict; it be a source of conflict resolution. So, whether it's the Palestinians or the Jordanians, with providing them with large quantities of water was the Egyptians or others in the Arab world who prefer not to be identified, who are trained by Israeli hydrologists and how to better manage their water, whether it's, whether it's um, um, you know, people even farther afield who really don't want to be identified, but who through secondary parties are able to get um, Israeli technology installed in their countries. There's a big story to tell here, and it's a pathway to peace. Countries that previously had no diplomatic relations with Israel now gladly partner with Israel. We had that a few months ago where a series of African countries came to Israel to talk about how to improve uh, water there too. Yeah, and I, I think the improvement and addressing of the local needs is important. The economics often makes it difficult for business to justify investment, but in fact we've seen that's quite the opposite in agriculture and places where if you have no water you have no business. So I'm right. curious hear what you're hearing from business about their desire to invest. Is it has it reached an urgency even the price even though the price hasn't been fixed yet? Well as long, I'm gonna have to go in a minute or two, but uh, just let me help you with this. Is that on on a price level, it's all about if you don't have a price for water then people have no incentive to improve their water systems. So but as long as water is available and seen as free or, or subsidized why would anybody spend the money for um, uh, for you know technology? But once we start 
treating water in a common sense way, do we treat it not as an inexhaustible and free good, but something that has a real real price and as the price we pay for the real price of water, then suddenly people start saying, oh, well, I can substitute this out with more technology, and then that starts to work a little bit better for you. Uh, exactly, and uh, Odette explained that I think the price in Israel is market-based, and because of that, people do then invest in um, more efficient technologies to manage it, and the conservation practices as well. And uh, we use the analogy: a lot of municipalities are now doing scalable pricing, where once you get past the minimum use, you start to see 2x, 3x accelerated fees to incentivize savings and uh, so it will be interesting to hear what they come up with next week. Um, Seth, we really... Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a sell it, I'm not a sell it for one, I'm not, as I say all the time, I'm not an ideologue, I'm a pragmatist and I don't really care what methodology is used, but clearly we have to have a methodology. We can't continue down the path we are and think we're going to have a, a robust future with adequate food supply because it's all going to, it's all going to come crashing down sooner than we think. No, yeah, well, and it's wonderful to have the model that you have so clearly mapped out, and as you acknowledge, it's really the water engineers over the history of Israel who have made this a priority and uh, valued that precious resource that is uh, becoming extremely scarce. So we look forward to having you back, Seth. And we encourage anybody who hasn't already done so to purchase a copy of Let There Be Water. It's a tremendous summer read.